Good evening, and welcome to the American Antiquarian Society's virtual public program, The Odyssey of Phyllis Wheatley, A Poet's Journeys Through American Slavery and Independence with David Waldstreicher. The American Antiquarian Society is located on the ancestral homelands of the Nipmuc tribal community who remain an active presence here in central Massachusetts. I'm Scott Casper, president of AAS. Our mission is to cultivate a deeper understanding of the American past, grounded in the primary sources AAS has been collecting since 1812. In addition to welcoming researchers from around the world to use our collections, both physical and digital, we host programs like tonight's that provide insights into the past and its resonance for our own day. This evening's program is our third this year concerned with the poet Phyllis Wheatley, whose book, Poems on Various Subjects, Religious and Moral, appeared in 1773, 250 years ago this year. It was the first published book of poetry by an African-American author, and only the third book of poetry published by an American woman. Wheatley became a celebrity in her own brief lifetime, and has especially in recent years been the subject of increasing study and attention, including by researchers who've used AAS's collections, such as Tara Bynum, Honoré Fanon Jeffers, and tonight's author, David Waldstreicher. We thank you for joining us this evening. And as a nonprofit organization, we welcome any support you can provide to help keep this work going. Thank you. During this program, my colleague John Garcia will be sharing a few notes on how to comment and ask questions in the Zoom Q&A. John will also be posting links and relevant information in the chat throughout the program. The program is being recorded and will be available afterward on our YouTube channel following tonight's live stream. And now I'm happy to introduce David Waldstreicher, an extraordinary cultural historian whom I've known since we were in graduate school. David is Distinguished Professor of History at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. He has written a series of significant books on the period of American and global revolutions from the 1760s to the early 19th century, beginning with the award-winning In the Midst of Perpetual Fets, The Making of American Nationalism, 1776 to 1820. He followed that with Runaway America, Benjamin Franklin, Slavery and the American Revolution, and then with Slavery's Constitution, From Revolution to Ratification. Along the way, David has also edited The Struggle Against Slavery, A History of In Documents, which is for, made for high school students, and edited The Diaries of John Quincy Adams, 1779 to 1846, for the Library of America, as well as several important collections of scholarly essays. He has been the recipient of fellowships from the Dorothy and Lewis B. Cullman Center for, this, for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library, the American Philosophical Society, and the Gilder Lehrman Institute of American History, and of course, here at the American Antiquarian Society in 1992-93, among others. Among the hallmarks of David Wallstreicher's work are his attention to the complex interplay of slavery and American independence, and his nuanced analysis of cultural texts. These are hallmarks fully on display in his new book, The Odyssey of Phyllis Wheatley. So it's a pleasure to welcome David back to AAS virtually to talk about it. Welcome, David. Thank you, Scott. It's it's great to be here. And the great it's always great to be at AAS in any way. Well, I, I couldn't agree more. And we're delighted that you're back and looking forward to having you back here soon, I hope, in person as well. As, as your book, The Odyssey of Phyllis Wheatley, opens, it's late summer 1767. The Wheatley family, that is the family in whose home Phyllis is enslaved, are seated around their dinner table talking with merchants who've survived a monstrous storm. And then, in your words, the girl came with bowls, with bread. She did not sit at the table, but she listened. And that's our introduction to Phyllis, who is at this point about 14 years old. And it's an episode that allows you to look both backward to the ship voyage that brought her to America in 1761 and forward to the poem that she would write after that evening in 1767 and then the poetry that that would lay ahead in her in her future david what do we know of phyllis's early life from her birth in africa to this moment at the wheatley table with which you start and how how do we know what we know mm. 
Well, we actually know more about her voyage than we do for most Africans who crossed the Atlantic in the 18th century because there are some letters from the uh, owner to the ship captain that are in the Medford Historical Society. And I and that, that becomes the, ba the basis for the first chapter. She's, uh, we, we don't, but even so, what we know is that she's probably from West Africa, um, almost certainly from West Africa, but we don't know exactly where, that she was about seven or eight years old. That, um, and that she, uh, the, the ship um, made several stops, probably, as, as several of uh, Timothy Fitch's other ships did in the years before and after uh, in, in West Africa, possibly also in the Caribbean. And um, then return then come to Boston where she's sold with um with some with some other enslaved people who have not already been sold at the other ports of call and uh much of the what the rest of what we know is in a um a biographical essay which is really the preface to an edition of her poems that was published by a descendant of the Wheatleys in the 1830s Margareta Odell wrote it and uh, she has some details that she said she was told um, about Phyllis arriving um, and um, being uh, shivering in a in a in a kind of um, blanket and um, but charm but charming to Susanna Wheatley, who buys her as a kind of um, replacement for her um, deceased younger daughters, uh, and um, be, and for what other purposes we we don't exactly know we know very little actually about what kinds of labor phyllis did but we can imagine that she that she worked in the household it's not it would be odd if she didn't and um but very quickly she um expresses a desire to learn and maybe also demonstrates her knowledge of writing by writing on the walls uh, making marks on the walls uh, and um, we don't know exactly uh, who who taught her, but probably the women in the family, Susanna and Mary Wheatley, uh, taught her to read. And within a couple of years, she doesn't just know how to read. She is writing and reciting poems for uh, elegies and um, devotional poems that are quite impressive and that they start to show around. And... Um, by the time uh, when she, by the time she's fourteen, uh, that that the poem to the merchants Hussey and Coffin, uh, I think I like to start with it because um, uh, both because of its themes, but also because it was the first of her poems to be published. It was published in a newspaper in Newport, and that to me is the beginning of another phase of her um, journey to fame, really, which. Um, uh, if you fast forward a couple of years later, she's not only publishing poems, but she writes the most reprinted and admired poem on the death of the great evangelist, George Whitfield. Uh, and that is that gets published on both sides of the Atlantic and which really make her a, a celebrity at the age of 17. Which is incredible to think about. I mean, it's incredible to think about because she's you know, a teenager, and because she's an enslaved teenager in this in this Boston household, how did getting published work in the 1760s, especially for an enslaved girl or, or a young woman? What did the process look like? Well, there, there, the two most important things here is that um, poetry is still is still part of a manuscript culture. Poems are performed and they're written down and passed around and appreciated and included in letters. So Wheatley's becoming known by this kind of what, what um, early modern medieval, early modern historians call scribal publication. Things haven't changed that much. On the other hand, printed poetry is also part of popular culture at this time. But and and on the other hand, women who publish poems are usually not supposed to do it of their own volition. It usually has to be somebody else's idea and even and published without their name. And so all those things play into these 
these sort of early efforts to put her poem out there. But what's important about her poetry from the beginning is they can't resist saying this isn't just interesting poetry. It's also interesting because of who she is, because she's this young enslaved girl. And maybe it says something that this young enslaved woman or child in Boston is um, only a few years off the boat and a Christian. And that that has huge implications. So, so uh, what becomes pretty pretty obvious within a couple of years is the fact that she can become so accomplished says something about the possibilities of of um, of how skilled Africans are becoming uh, as they assim as they assimilate and become and are become and are becoming are so central uh, to life e even in Boston. But it also suggests something about that about um, that the efforts of evangelicals who are hoping to, uh, we might say, take the edge off of enslaving or justify it or make it better, um, may be coming to something, and yeah. that maybe Phyllis herself and her poetry will be an engine of converting more native people and Africans. So it's a it's also and. As Wendy Roberts has has made clearer than than anyone in in her work, um, poetry is part of is also part of worship uh, at this time in ballads and in devotional writings. Um, and um, the role that Phyllis very quickly comes to uh, comes to occupy is parallel to those of ministers and lay preachers in her poetry and it's surprising how bold they are the, the forms of address the way she'll the way she sometimes basically tells people how to feel about their their the death of their loved ones and how they should keep focus focus on salvation and focus on how they've gone to a better place if they were if they were if they were pious if they were saved so that she's able to occupy this space which on the one hand um is might seem to be very narrow and constricting but on the other hand um lends her surprising amount of authority uh to her to her to a pious voice which then she runs with uh in in other in political uh and other and other directions but in terms of how the how the poetry how how things get published there's also there's also uh, one thing that I didn't appreciate until I was well into researching and and even writing the book was that there is a um long standing and as in decades a uh, trend in british literature in popular literature for ordinary ordinary working people women and men uh who write poetry to get discovered by aristocrats and then promoted uh yeah. in ways that show uh, how tasteful and benevolent their patrons are so basically there's a rage for working class poets for tailor poets and thresher poets and um Scrub women poets, um, Mary Leepor, Stephen Duck. So, in a way, Wheatley is a kind of North American version of that. Of course, it's so. This way, like, oh my God, like, like, can you believe this enslaved? Like, like, it's the next logical step. Is oh, if it's going to be an American, it's going to be an enslaved person because that's what America means. That's what's different about North America. So, so I eventually came to see, like, you know, she's like. If, if Phyllis Wheatley hadn't come along to invent herself with the help of the Wheatleys, somebody else would have tried to invent a Phyllis Wheatley because it was the logical with all these factors going into it. Like, of course, it's poetry. Of, of course, it's a woman. Of course, it's an enslaved person in Boston, the most literate town. Right. Um, and uh, and of course, it's at this this post 1750s moment where the number of poems of, and books of poetry published by women and by ordinary people is doubling every decade the literary historians have told us. It's just increasing massively. And you, you write that print is the internet of the 18th century and couplets were its tweets. I mean, this is, you know, this is- That passed muster? Is that going to pass muster with the historians of the book at AAS? I some, liked it. I thought, some, I thought it was- You liked it? Okay. Some historians are giving me a hard time for that, but I stuck by it. We'll see. I, I thought it was great. I mean, I thought it really brings home your point. And, and one of the great things about this book is how how- accessible it is from a 21st century perspective. And, and it's lines like that, that I think that bring it home. I, I thought it was very interesting. Uh, and this picks up on your point, how in her poetry, she's claiming authority to write about the individuals and the events that she's writing about, or maybe the poetry is itself a claim of authority. But you know, as you read the poems, and there's a lot of 
analysis of the poetry itself in this book, you are really explicating how she claims the authority to write about things that maybe she would, but the way you're describing it now, maybe she would have been thought um, authorized to write about them the way that working class people in Britain were writing about famous people and and significant events too. There's a gesture in her poems um, in some of the early ones that carries all the way through to some of her boldest ones where she does talk directly about slavery and about being taken from Africa. And it, it, the gesture goes something like this. Even I, or I especially, understand and know this. So take it from me. It might seem like I don't, but actually, like, like she writes this poem, early poem to the to Harvard students, which is basically about them, like, like get serious, guys. You're, you're supposed to become ministers and you're screwing around and like playing with like, you know, playing with secularism and or whatever else. It's one of her most pious poems, but she's basically, it's, uh, she's mocking them, but then she says, you know, like, like um, if like if, if I can be saved and I can keep focused on God, why the hell can't you guys? And that's that move that she finds a way to get away with, where she's basically saying, yeah, I'm humble. Yeah, I know exactly who I am and, and who you think I am, but I am going to use this to shame you into doing the right thing. But I'm not going to do it in an in your face personal way. I'm going to do it in this general way where we're all on the same team. It's a brilliant, it's a brilliant rhetorical move. And she becomes so expert at it. And so I, I ended up taking some of these, some of these things that some white people said about her later in her life, about how pleasing she was and what great manners, table manners she had. And that like that used to be taken as saying, oh, what an Oreo she is. She never challenged anything. She didn't have enough race consciousness. It's no, actually she takes what's expected of her and pushes it just as far as it can go and does things with it that actually do make people think twice about their presumptions and make it possible for her to do more and more, which you see happening, like uh, I, I think I can show it chapter after chapter, year after year. The poetry gets bolder, her opportunities get greater, her network expands, and um, uh, that it's 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 a winning set of strategies that is that is uh, uh both about her incre her incredible artistic growth but also about the the, per the persona that she projects uh so brilliantly and 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 successfully and and this came as i was reading this came as a surprise to me because years ago i remember wheatley's poetry being categorized as somewhat traditional or formulaic neoclass neoclassical 18th century verse full of allusions from classical antiquity, somewhat difficult to approach. You just, you read it so differently from that traditional interpretation. And, you know, in, in your acknowledgments, you describe how some of this happened in your classroom where your students were talking about Wheatley's poetry and you started reading it out loud, almost in different voices to hear what she's up to. Yeah, well, the starting point had to be on being brought from Africa to America, because that's the most Henry Louis Gates rightly called it the remote, the most reviled poem in African American literature. Um, yeah, and uh, so that I mean that you one one has to have a, a take on that if one if one has a take on Wheatley. And I uh, was teaching an American studies course I called the Literature of Slavery at Temple, and um, at Temple. Uh, I, I am not that that ex I'm not so explicit about this. I, I kind of hint at it, I guess, in the um, in the uh, in the acknowledgments. But um, at Temple, we have a, a Temple is, has always prided itself or for a long time has prided itself on being uh, the diversity university. Right. Being a bit. Right. Uh, we're, we're in Philadelphia, which is a which is a city that's half half black. And the the university is is uh, has people has so many people from all over the world, as well as from Philadelphia. And um, we have a very uh, a, a traditionally uh, strong and popular Black Studies program, and um, so I had uh, different voices in the classroom with different presumptions. And Wheatley was traditionally taught as a negative example in an Afrocentric paradigm that says that you know where she's not proud enough, right? So right. some students were coming in knowing that Wheatley. Other students were coming in knowing that Wheatley is the beginning of a African American literary tradition that has been sustaining, right? So that there were these different narratives. So like, you know, the students were arguing about, were, argue, were arguing about it and you could tell it was as much about what they came in with as what was on the page, you know? So I, I just said, okay, well, let's 
let's see if it if, the, if it can be maybe let's see who let's see who's right or let's see if both of both can be right so i actually stood up on a chair and i <laughs> declaimed i read the poems uh, I, I read it. I read On Being Grown from Africa to America in a beseeching um, uh, um, voice and in a ironic, challenging voice. And, you know, it was uh, it kind of uh, it kind of worked both ways. And I think it it, it, it made me and the, 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 the conversation we had about that made me think, OK, maybe I have a contribution here to make. Uh, maybe there's more to the story. I think pro probably really, to be honest, um, I might as well be at this point because um, I can't change anything in the book. Um, I think the thing was actually, um, I had to, it was, it was persuading um, one of the black students in particular who was extremely bright, but who had, was very skeptical of Wheatley and who I, I was hoping w could see that there was more to it, persuading her to like, okay, maybe there's something here. That's when I felt like, okay, maybe I have, maybe I, maybe, um, maybe I should be writing about Wheatley um, because uh, maybe there's still something uh, to be said here that I can say. Yeah. And, and your title, The Odyssey of Phyllis Wheatley, you know, it feels almost foreordained because it, because it connects this remarkable global journey of her own brief life because we haven't we haven't even gotten to her going to london yet we'll we'll get there but you know collect connects that with the classical allusions that suffuse the poetry and then you kind of turn this and you say she's homer and odysseus and the slaves and the women they knew or imagined so she's you know she's inhabiting all of these roles as you as you explicate her work well, this was the other the other aha moment on my way to the book was um, I re I decided that I needed to read everything that I that I could tell that she read or probably read, and um, I had more of a I I never studied Greek or Roman classics in my education. We we American studies PhDs uh, uh, didn't they didn't make us do it. they certainly didn't make us do it in grad school. And I was an English major and I didn't do it in college either. So. Uh, I had more, much more of a head start on the Bible than I did with um, with that. So I I I read um, I read the Iliad. Okay, um, you know, I kind of plowed through it. I was, you know, like, okay, this is interesting. This is about war. This is, you know, the, but um, then when I started to listen, I I got I got it. I I got these cassette tapes of the Fagel's translation on mm -hmm. on books on tape, and I was commuting at the time, so I'm listening to it. And especially the Odyssey, I just something clicked, and I realized, oh, this is about voyages, but this is yep. also about enslavements and war and um, the traffic in women, especially mm -hmm. and redemption. And this is about an ancient Mediterranean world in which all those things, ships and voyages and slavery and uh, and 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 women and young women as potentially figures who can change everything and masters and slaves, that all these things are connected. And, and Wheatley's reading this. She's not like some African, like like reading, like something we imagine is completely foreign. This is familiar. This is this Mediterranean world is not that different than her West African and Atlantic world. So like maybe she's engaged, she's interested in engaging with it because she can work with it and and thus explore things and even talk about things that she can't talk about directly because nobody wants the no, none of the white people want to hear her talk about how terrible the slave ship was or how much she misses her parents or uh, what it was actually like to be a trafficked person and uh, or in war torn West Africa uh, and the Atlantic. So that that all of a sudden that gave that made me a lot more interested in Greek and Roman literature, and <laughs> um, I started to pay more attention to 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 uh, like and these other like Terence uh, Terence former slave who she um, connects with, and like I started to notice like Horace is all over her, and Horace's father had been an enslaved person, and so uh, so then I I really started uh, um, re reeducating myself in. Uh, I thought I knew 18th century British literature or about it I, I, because I do print culture, but uh, I really had to go back into the literature and realize that this whole neoclassical thing is much more interesting and complicated uh, and uh, than, than I realized and that, that um, 
really uh, the, the the translation, like that that all this stuff was translated, and and for the poets in the 18th century, like Pope. And the others that Wheatley was reading, like to, to do a translation, a poetic translation in English was the like the highest ambition. And that Wheatley didn't even have to read Greek and Latin to feel like this stuff was hers, just like reading the Old and New Testament in English uh, put her into this um, uh, this world. And she doesn't have to be uh, uh, she doesn't have to read Hebrew in order or 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 um, or Greek to. Uh, in order to be really engaged and arguing over and spinning those texts. And that's what, and that's what she does. And, and people recognize that at least the <laughs> literate people do. And she does it in a, she does it really in a way that's um, uh, uh, not overbearing, but like, but not, not off putting either. I think, I mean, at least how I imagine her being read, um, read uh, at that, at that time. Do we have, evidence? What evidence do we have of how people read her? We have evidence that people read her. What do we know about the how of it? Well, some of the best evidence comes from jo the merchant John Andrews, who's kind of a fanboy of hers. And uh, I, I'm able to use him at several points because he's just following everything she does. And it turns out, and his wife is also a poet who's completely intimidated by her. Like she writes some stuff about like there's, there's one point at which she writes something about one of their relatives, uh, uh, an infant who dies, and she she writes this poem, and um, it's pretty good. And then it turns out Phyllis has written an elegy to it. She reads Phyllis's, and then she's like, John, do not show anybody my poem. <laughs> my, like, 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 just keep it to yourself. And he's like, oh, like, oh, like, I, like, she's really like, like, I'm. Uh, she writes to their, uh, uh, her, bro his, his, partner who's also her brother that like um the, about this like how and it becomes clear uh and um wendy roberts also uh, discovered um some of um ruth barrel andrews's uh poems and manuscript that like and that those kind of examples where there, there's this whole cohort of young female poets some of them da daughters of ministers hannah mather crocker is another one they're like yeah. completely taken with her and they're like they i think they're they i think they probably traded books and introduced each other and they like they 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 see her as um one of I, I we don't know how like the personal relationships were and whether that you know what distance there may have been but they 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 um they know they know they know they they there are enough people like they're the commentary nobody saying nobody until the book reviews and until it's already like her she's already being used at there are no negative reviews or negative comments on her poetry until it's already being used as as anti as an anti slave as an example of what's wrong with slavery and that black people are really equal, which shows that slavery is wrong. In other words, like everybody can see how how good a poet she is. There's absolutely no evidence of. Um, in fact, uh, Jeremy Belknap uh, in 1773, we have this like this little this little three line ballad she wrote that. Um, Vince Car Vin Caretta found uh, in, in one of Belknap's almanacs where he wrote in 1772 or 73, Phyllis Wheatley's first effort. Like, and it's like, it's like a, it's like, it's just like a little, a little rhyme about, about um, one of their neighbors who had, who had died. And it's like, um, it's like, they're already like, like, wow, look how far she's come. Let's, let's like save this little scrap that I, that I, that I wrote down or that I remembered or somebody showed me from five years ago. She's already, that's how much of a prodigy she is. That's how much everybody recognizes that like the, the, the sky is the limit for her. So, so I'm very impatient with those who, who the, the critic, the, the people who said in the later in the 19th century or in the early 20th century that she wasn't an interesting poet. They just lost the ability to read 18th century poetry because of things that happened after that, or it was just simple racism or some combination thereof. Right, because if they looked at her own day, people people understood how talented she was and and how terrific her work was. And you know, and then yeah, and read the other poetry in the newspaper and compare it. And compare it. Just just look at them side by side, and you know. And you know, and so. It's now 1773. She's about 20 years old, and she's been publishing her work, what, for about six or seven years at this point, and she's about 20 years old, and she boards a ship to England. So her, you know, her second, her next major ocean journey is from, from Massachusetts to England. How'd that journey come about, and what did she accomplish there? She's going to get her book published, right? But what's, you know, how does that all happen?
Well, the most I, one of the things I stress about how it happens is how much it's really can be seen as as her doing. Mm -hmm. She has this very interesting interaction with a a uh, merchant and minor colonial official named Thomas Woolridge, who uh, is knows Lord Dartmouth and may owe his appointment in Florida, Lord Dartmouth, and he's traveling around, and he goes to see Phil he goes to see Phyllis Wheatley, and he's probably goes to see her because he knows that Lord Dartmouth, who's just been appointed Under Secretary of State for the Colonies, uh, is. A Methodist and supportive of these effort of these conversion efforts and friends with the Countess of Huntington, and is probably going to be very interested in someone like Wheatley. So he goes to Wheatley and what and he's hoping to have a story. Uh, and maybe even get a poem that he can send to Lord Dartmouth to show that he is basically a good agent. And so he goes to visit Wheatley and he does this peculiar thing where he uh, says, um, in one way or another, um, this is all great, but um, how do I know for sure you wrote these poems, or could you write one for me so that I can show it to Lord Dartmouth or something? But he said, he, what he writes to Dartmouth is, uh, I, asked her, like, I asked her if she could write a poem now so I could see that she did it. And she, she says, well, why don't you, well, on what topic? And he suggests Lord Dartmouth as a topic. And she says, come back tomorrow. <laughs> and he does, or this is how he tells the story. And she has this amazing 50 line poem to Lord Dartmouth, which is all about how everything's going to be wonderful because Lord Dartmouth understands the, the, colonies complaint about taxation and everything's going to be much better and and then she talks about if you wonder why i'm so um sensitive to liberty it's because i was taken from my father from africa and it's like it's one of her boldest most interesting poems she probably had it in her pocket she'd probably been working on it for she probably knew that somebody was going to come she knew all about who lord dartmouth was she i I'm, it's clear she's reading the newspapers and so Woolridge sends it to Lord Dartmouth, and this is a, one of the series of, of connections, including with the Countess of Huntingdon, who is sponsoring the early slave narratives, that sets up this uh, her poem being published in London and her voyage there to basically go on a kind of preemptive book tour to be seen so that everyone knows she wrote she wrote them and, and, and to get patrons who will sign up and um, be known to have signed up. And one of the first people she goes to, uh, something that's never been really... Uh, talked about before is Lord Littleton, George Littleton, who has been a patron of poets and writers, Henry Fielding, James Thompson, you name it, going and a friend of Ale a young friend of Al Alexander Pope. He's been a patron for 40 years. All these or anybody who wants to get a book of poems published in London goes and tries to get Lord Dar uh, Lord Littleton to sign up for it. He actually has this nickname. His nickname is Maysenis. Why is that? Well, Maecenas is the was the patron of Virgil and and Horace, mm -hmm. and everyone knows this, and that's why he has that nickname. And there's been this puzzle all these years. Why does Wheatley, the first poem in her book is to Maecenas, and it's all like who? So who's Maecenas? Who's this patron that she is writing to about about what about what her ambition is and what she's doing? Is it Susanna Wheatley? Is it Countess Huntingdon? Is it? Um, Mather Biles, is it a combination of all these people? All plausible. But like, if you know who Lord Littleton is, like she does, it's like, it's a bid for a higher, for the highest possible patron. She doesn't know. Well, it actually turns out that two weeks after she goes and visits Lord Littleton, he, he dies of a stroke. <laughs> so it's completely, this connection is completely forgotten because Lord Littleton can't, couldn't do it. He got sick and he couldn't, yeah, he couldn't do anything for her. But so I'm not blaming scholars who didn't pick up on this. I just, you know, but but it's but it's a it's it's just that's just one example that I give or one part of this this marketing effort and this self-making effort that she does with the help of the Wheatley. She goes over on their their ship, the London Packet, uh, with Nathaniel Wheatley, uh, and really become really um takes London by storms. And in, in, within six weeks, she has become uh, 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 an, another kind of person and uh, who um, is already being 
uh, praised and looked at as an example of of, of both um, what's possible and uh, but also possibly American hypocrisy as one of the first as one of the first reviews uh, attests. So that's that's part that's part, at least part of the story of how it happens and why she goes to London. Um, I'm and uh, it. Bec it becomes embarrassing for the Wheatleys that she's still enslaved. And um, I lay out a number of scenarios in one chapter whereby uh, one way or another, possibly because it was already going to happen once she, the book was published, but also possibly because the Wheatleys are embarrassed and being called out. There is no way that she can be this famous and the owner of her book and still be enslaved. So uh, at one, at some point in this process, she gets her freedom. Yeah. And, you know, the, the way you lay that out, really explaining the possible explanations for how she gets her freedom is great because, you know, it could be these things, but ultimately it could very much be the Wheatleys can't afford to, to have the story being told that, you know, she owns her book, but she doesn't own herself. You know, she, she needs to, she, she must be free. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so much of your book is about relationships, about the relationships Phyllis develops with not just the Wheatleys, but people whose worlds intersect with hers. One example is Samson Occam, the Mohegan teacher and preacher, a relationship I, I didn't know anything about before. Yes. Uh, the, one of the things that it is, is very clear in the little... Um... A little preface or uh, attestation that John Wheatley writes. I actually think Nathaniel, the son Nathaniel Wheatley, Wheatley wrote it. Uh, that's in the in the volume of, of poems. In addition to saying she she uh, when when she came over from Africa and she was such a quick study, he says that one of the first things she wrote that was so impressive was a letter to Samson Ockham while he was in England. Samson Ockham going to London and. Um, uh, impressing people and raising money for Moore's Indian Charity School was really the model for her voyage also uh, and, and, and her ambition. And she continues to have this relationship with Occam, which also leads to this very impressive letter, which I think Occam then gets published in the, in the newspaper in 1774, which is re reprinted everywhere. But uh, really, um, Wheatley and Occam are part of this real... Um, emergence of people of color in print uh, in a way that, that is really open-ended about what it's going to mean. And it's a kind of glass half empty, half full thing. Because on the one hand, uh, you could say that it doesn't amount to as much for them individually as it might have the fame that they gained. And there's a lot of pushback, but it really, on the other hand, they're, do, they're, they're really um, pushing various cultural envelopes and engaged in a, a process that everybody knows is, um, has serious implications and that leads them to be really um, the most famous Occam. Uh, Occam is as famous as any um, native chief or king in the 18th century becomes uh, a, a celebrity and Wheatley becomes the most, the best known um, African person in, in the West uh, yeah. of her, of her time. Um, and, the question is going to be, what is she going to do with that, or what can she do with that, both personally and 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 politically? And that really is um, her doing, not the Wheatleys. Who um, we don't actually—it's very hard to say exactly what the Wheatleys had in mind, except that it's clear that they're kind of savvy and behind her. But because we actually, as few letters as we have from Phyllis Wheatley, and as as few comments we have, uh, the the kind of footprints and relationships that I. Uh, had to follow and figure out who these people were and and what these interactions meant and try to build a biography out of these footprints. We know in some some ways we know even less about the Wheatleys. They left even less because um, they uh, all the re the whole immediate Wheatley family they're they're all dead before uh, before Phyllis was. They don't leave a, they, they, even in even even as even as Massachusetts people who were merchants and wrote a lot of stuff down like they all did. There's almost nothing at the Massachusetts Historical Society about the White Wheatleys. That is remarkable. And when you consider that, that Phyllis herself doesn't live much past this, you know, she dies in the, the early 1780s, um, but she leaves, you know, this whole volume of poetry, um, as well as some letters and so on. And um, 
So I'm gonna um, I'm gonna start turning to some of the questions that are coming in. We've got questions coming in from from our our viewers, and so I'll I'll intersperse those with some of mine. D. Andrews writes, uh, "Your work is so exciting. I just got the book and can't wait to read it." Here's a question for you: Was Phyllis Wheatley's inability to get an American publisher for her poems significant? Seemingly so, but I wonder too if seeking a Lo London publisher was considered something more important by Phyllis Wheatley and her patrons. Yes, uh, I'm, I, uh, some of the, some of the best writing about Wheatley, um, stressed how difficult it was for her to get the book published. Uh, there, there are several proposals. They're clearly talking about it, um, early on, uh, and, it's also clear that uh, the Patriot poets are not very interested. Uh, the Patriot, I'm sorry, the Patriot printers are not very interested. Oh, yeah. And the yeah. ones who she does seem to have a relationship with, like um, Ebenezer um, Russell, uh, are not in a position to really uh, do it. Uh, or do it do it well, and I think that um, I, I think that maybe too much of an emphasis has been done on like on the like the ideological repression uh, of the of the patriots and saying like well you know they they don't they don't want to be embarrassed by her um, look you people crying for liberty you, especially in Boston and here you have this enslaved person so so it's it, like it's true that the the it seems like the more conservative printers are more maybe you know publisher more often but that that isn't consistent it's not it's not completely clear I think it's actually like it's actually more contingent on uh, you know Russell practically goes out of business shortly after he. Um, first proposes to do her poems. And Isaiah Thomas really isn't in a position to do it either. And then they get more ambitious, as Dee uh, is rightly suggesting, that it, it that maybe it's even better to get it published in London. And in the meantime, uh, you start to see um, the slave narratives and you start to see more stuff coming out of London and more of a sense of a more, a more transatlantic um, uh, if not anti-slavery, at least slavery critical or slavery reforming uh, set of prints that um, really, even though the Countess of Huntsman is not anti-slavery at all, um, that is makes it seem like um, just a natural thing to do to publish it in Lo in London, and that takes some time to make happen. So I don't I don't think it's I think it is really about um greater ambition and more seeming possible and it's not really something that is seen as a um well we can't do it here so we'll have to do it there because because of racism in boston as it's sometimes been described and it could be as much about the infrastructure of publishing and book publishing in the two places as it is about racism that is um you know, for a book to get published by a printer in the colonies is is more of an endeavor. And it's unlikely then to have resonance across the pond in, in London than the other way around. Right. It needs to, it's be, it's a better long-term strategy to start there. They know they're gonna they know it's gonna sell. They know people know who she is in New England. So exactly. it really was a was a um and and I guess the 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 um it's just not unusual for, and this becomes obvious from reading the newspapers and the ads that the printers put out. There are a lot of projects, a lot, a, a lot of book projects and pamphlets that never get off the ground, or and or that that don't sell. It's they more more often than not. That's right. They don't get published. They're, you know, we think of them as, um, you know, the term it sometimes uses is, is ghost. You know, we have the advertisement for right. something, but we never, we don't have the book itself. The book may never have happened. Um, yeah. Uh, Julia Watson writes, thanks for that terrific and enlightening talk on Wheatley. This is not a, she writes, real question, but I wonder if you know the 2021 autobiographical photo essay by Nigerian American writer and photographer Teju Cole, Go Golden Apple of the Sun, in which a reflection on Wheatley's employers in Cambridge and her brief life are discussed. It's a different take than yours on the condescension of the family's racism. Is this a 
a reference that that rings a bell? No, I I missed that one though. I, okay. I certainly um, was collecting the many many uh, uh, yeah. poetic and dramatic and um, novelistic responses to Wheatley, uh, especially in the wake of the way that uh, Gates popularized the scene of what he call, calls the trial that ne of Phyllis Wheatley, which never actually happened. But we can uh, I don't know. If we have time to talk about that. And um, but I missed that one. And I'll, yeah. I'll certainly I'll certainly look for it. Generally, I I'm uh, I uh, I do have a little bit to say about a, a chapter, a chapter at the end on Wheatley's memory and how fast, how wonderful and fascinating it is that the recent current and recent generations of black artists are spinning the story and the legend of Wheatley, not all in the same direction. Um, with with a lot of nuances, it's become a kind of a, um, really a multivalent text for talking about the dilemma of the black artist, the uses of tradition, and especially with a sensitivity toward her 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 youth and her her femininity and her religiosity and and all the things that go into it. So instead of I I I love it because um, I think I'm I'm I, I'd like to think I've been working in a similar spirit and because it's so much about not what she wasn't but about the many things that she was so that even if it, they don't all get it right or have the same interpretation I do I think there's a similar understanding that there's a lot there to work through um, and a lot there a lot of a lot of potential meaning uh, in her in how we think about her and how we place her in the past and in relation to the present. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Carla Peterson, whom you write, whom you acknowledge in your acknowledgments, um, writes, and she calls it a thought that doesn't end in a question. I'm struck by how many varied and different communities Phyllis inhabited, readers, writers, mentors, etc. Seems very complex. How did she manage or respond to such complexities of community? I think the, the the most simple and direct way I can answer that great question would be to say that I think she was an expert code switcher. Yeah, yeah. That, um, I hope it's not outrageous. I know Carla won't think so, but I, I hope it's not outrageous for me to say that because we usually think of code switching as the thing that people who speak Black English do when they're elsewhere or vice versa, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, anyone who's been part of two, one or more than one subculture, code switches. I mean, I think like, like it's like the way my New York accent comes out when I'm here in New York, as opposed to when I'm elsewhere or, uh, and you know, so um, I think that, I, I think we can see, for example, the, like the way she, um, talks more religious in the even in the few letters we have she talks more religious to some to John Thornton or to Obor Tanner but to Obor Tanner she also talks more critically about our modern Egyptians than she did to others and um and to Samson Occam by implication in the letter she writes to him that he then publishes an excerpt from in the newspapers I think without her approval and we get the sense that oh like you know like she's not just so we we've always thought like we're always assuming we're always assuming that poets, uh, great poets speak their soul, like and aren't engaged in speaking differently to different audiences, but um, that's that's what she's doing. And I think that, that her ability to network and to manage these different audiences in an 18th century that we, an 18th century New England that we too, too often think of as monocultural yeah. um, is, uh, that's her brilliance really, that she's able to do that as a person, as well as as in in her writing, yeah, and and it, these are not monocultural worlds that she inhabits. We have a few questions about specific information. Uh, an anonymous attendee asks: Some of what we know about Wheatley is due to her letters to Ober Tanner, whom you've mentioned, and who's a major figure in Tara Bynum's book. Also, do any of Ober's letters to Wheatley exist? No, they don't. You know of, yeah. Um, and um, Tara has written brilliantly about their exchanges and about their friendship and about, and most recently, uh, at, um, at a program we did at, at, at MHS, uh, 
speculated productively about o Ober's decision to keep those letters for decades and decades and hand them to uh, to a member of the of the Beecher family uh, and get them into the a MHS archive and how much we are in debt to Ober Tanner for for what we know about Wheatley and how that was a, a kind of um, we need to really think about the implications of her doing that. So, and that so often we think about um, how biased the archive is and, and archival silences. Well, this is the archive speaking very loudly through the strenuous efforts of of, of uh, two literate black women in the 18th century who are who um, who shaped this archive that we have. Yeah, Stephen Sanfilippo asks. Were Wheatley's poems translated into other languages? How was her work seen in European countries other than England? I believe there have been translations um, in the 19th and 20th century, definitely in South America. I know more about some of the philosophes like Voltaire, and um, Abbe Grégoire reading her in English and then writing about her in French huh. as part of the debates over slavery and debates about African African equality and race. Yeah. So um, fortunately, uh, those folks were multilingual and yeah. that um, it was not necessary for her to be translated in order to be read. Um, internationally and that's so that's already happening yeah in, yeah very quickly mm -hmm. uh Raushan Chowdhury says the idea of Christianity runs across Phyllis Wheatley's poems but what kind of Christianity does she advocate especially because she speaks about refinement is she asking for conversion Uh, well, in that poem, she is she is um, talking about conversion. Though I think she's I think she's also um, mocking the way, actually mocking the way that um, some white people talk about refinement and conversion. Mm -hmm. But um, she's taking she's taking it for granted that the, the the process or acknowledgement of her conversion is the starting point. That has to that has to be worked through. The whole poem is really about the question of her of her conversion. I I'm I, I'm pretty uh, confident, and I'm uh, and and I'm. This isn't just me saying this. Some other Wheatley scholars agree that on the one hand, she is a a what um, Doug, Douglas Winarski would call a Whitfieldarian. She's um, she's an evangelical. She, it's all about conversion. It's all about the possibility of universal salvation, but not not automatic. You have to work at it and uh, these processes. And so she's kind of like uh, a Methodist or Methodist affiliated, even though she's really she's clearly congregationalist. Um, on the other hand, she's clearly by the time she's being bolder, not as focused or pious as some of her friends want her to be. You could say that she's growing out of a she's that growing out of it or she's secularizing or she's becoming more worldly. But um I so I I'm really wary of and this may be because I'm not at all invested in in how in how or how much someone's Christian, uh uh that um I'm really wary of kind of taking out a measuring stick and saying how Christian she was or exactly yeah. how she was Christian. I'm mm -hmm. and and this is where I think I think some some scholars and some readers are going to find me not sufficiently curious about the the Christian life of a Christian person. I'm much more interested in what she does with it and how it's connected to everything else and that's just how I approach religion and culture in American history and so I bring some strengths and some limits to the progress, to the project. And, you know, I'm sure someone else will do a deeper read of, uh, who's more sensitive to these issues, will do a do a deeper read of her um, her Christianity. That that sort of brings me to a kind of, leads to a question that I was wondering about, about 
your own process. You've talked a lot about your process of reading the classical sources. I'm always interested, and of course at AAS, we're always interested in the de 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 detective work behind the finished book. I think of your, you have an appendix of poetry that hadn't previously been attributed to Wheatley, but that you have made tentative attributions to Wheatley. How did you find it and how did you, did, did you determine it was hers? Well, I, one of the things that made the book came together and um, come together was something that took me years, which was I read, I looked at every page of every Boston newspaper from 1760 to 1784 and uh, uh, zeroing in on things that were that where I saw Africans and where I saw political and uh, debates and event and, re and religious ones for that matter and uh, other things that she would have been interested in. Uh, but um, I also looked at the poems because I wanted to get a sense of the the context for her writing. I, so if there was a poem in the newspaper, I looked at it. And I started to see some poems that were that looked that because of certain choices of words looked like she could have written them. And I thought, well, this is interesting. But then when I started to um, become convinced, that even though she's famous, the, the normal thing to do is publish poems in newspapers anonymously. Uh, that, and that she did publish a few without 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 signing her name to them, um, including well, one one I I think she wrote that not everybody does this one this one about the Boston massacre, which has no indication of of who wrote it at all. Uh, that maybe she wrote them, and why wouldn't she have done this? And maybe even after she's famous, after she's published the book, why not, if she's not sure about the quality of something, like why not, why not publish it and see? And so I, I uh, after thinking a long time about it, I decided that I, I decided that some, that, that what I should do is I should, uh, there's really no, uh, no way to prove it. These are not attributed. Like, we don't have manuscripts in her handwriting, but I think that to think that she didn't, Publish anonymously in newspapers like all the other women poets did is really uh, assuming too much. So I started to um, uh, uh, I, I started to ca I counted the words of like some of these words like Africa and some of these uh, words like sable and other words that she heavenly that she used in many or most of her poems uh, and and certain and I found a few even a few phrases that 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 you can see in uh, poems in newspapers and that. Uh, I did. I did internet searches. They're, 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 I can't find them in anybody else's poems, but that then show up in attributed poems. And uh, so I uh, tried with a very light hand, I, and not to make that big a deal a deal of it. And I was really worried that people would say, "Oh, the really original thing about this book is these uh, these un these poems that Walt Streicher says wrote them." I wrote. I published an article in Early American Literature about the first nine of these that date from 1774 and 1775. And there are a few others also, but um, I think I I I, I want. Uh, it's going to ultimately be up to Wheatley scholars to say whether we should consider these. And I already know that some are some have embraced them, and and a few are skept a few are quite skeptical. Uh, but I I think that um, uh, given the nature of the archive and the nature of the phenomenon that that she was, I think we have to err on the side of of um, considering it just the way that uh, Leo LeMay went back and looked at. Franklin's newspaper and said, oh, you know, he probably wrote this this paragraph in his newspaper or in the or in even in um, his brother's newspaper. Um, this sounds like him. Uh, it's similar to other things he wrote or said. Um, and I've read everything else that all these other wags of the 1720s and 30s have read as as Leo LeMay had. And so he, he actually published a book where he said uh, this one. No, this one. Yes, this one. Maybe I think it's that it's that kind of thing. And that and that. Um, it, they're they're really worth worth considering, and so I weave I weave some of them into the story and make the argument that like so if she this is what's probably going on if she wrote this and this one make and some of these I argue I I emphasize because they make sense that she would have written something like this at this time, just the mm -hmm. way the poems we know she wrote make sense that she wrote them at 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 that at that time. Yeah. So that so that's so uh, so I I really didn't have a model for doing this kind of work in a biography. So I, I, I hope I did it in a way that's both um, open and transparent, but not, but, um, 
doesn't turn the biography into a into a into a work into a, a work of detective literary criticism or history. I, I don't think it does that. I think it just adds adds to the interest in the way you the way you describe them is is not as oh I found this. It's really you know look at these possible possibilities. We are closing in on our our end time. I want to end with a question, and we've got a lot of other questions. We we will send you all the questions that we couldn't get to because um, questions are coming in fast and furious now. But Sydney Claus asks a question that um, that I was wondering about as well. And and Sydney says, "What lessons from Wheatley's story and work do you think are especially pertinent to the present or relevant to our current political climate?" And you know, I was I was thinking the same thing. What's what's her resonance? The resonance of her work for our own day, two hundred fifty years after the publication of her book. Well, there are two things that are especially important to me. One is that she's not just challenging slavery by example or by a few of the things she says about it. She's also challenging racism and race. She doesn't believe in race. She knows it's a ridiculous fiction that's being foisted upon her. And she can do that without any sacrifice of a, of a sense of solidarity with other Africans, but she does not. Um, and that I find that interesting um, and potentially useful. Along with that, she refuses to choose between an African identity, a British identity, and an American identity. So, uh, and this is where I, I uh, disagree with uh, with my um, esteemed colleague whose work I built on, Vin Coretta, who um, in some of his earlier writing emphasized her choice of identity when she comes back from London and doesn't stay there, which possibly she could have done, and comes back and uh, supports the Patriot cause. And as a result of the American Revolution, loses her patronage and maybe maybe loses a lot in the process. And like, you know, she is, that may be a political choice as well as a, uh, a very contingent set of life choices. Um, but I don't think that she uh, uh, really um, saw these identities as... Um, uh, necessarily incompatible, and part of that is just being a being being a pre-revolutionary person. But part of it also is a kind of a more flexible understanding of identity and affiliation and politics than uh, maybe um, subsequent Americans had. And it's a kind of a, she has a winning cosmopolitanism and universalism that does not make her any less critical of the nonsense that she is um, making such effective fun out fun of in her in some of her writings. David, thank you so much. This has been just a fascinating conversation. I want to thank you for writing a splendid book. I, I encourage all of you who are watching tonight to get this book. Um, also, if you want to recommend this conversation to your friends, all of our public programs are available on the AAS YouTube channel so that others can watch this program and hopefully then pick up the book, The Odyssey of Phyllis Wheatley. Um, David, so grateful to you. Um, I want to mention before we close tonight, we have two more programs this fall. Uh, on Thursday, November 30th at 2 p.m., we have a virtual conversation with Michael Roy, who's the author of Fugitive Texts, Slave Narratives, and Antebellum Print Culture. And then the following week on Thursday, December 7th at 7 p.m., we have a hybrid program here in Worcester and live streamed with the book dealer and manuscript dealer and forgery expert Kenneth Rendell about his new memoir, Safeguarding History, Trailblazing Adventures Inside the Worlds of Collecting and Forging History. Please join us. For now, thanks to David Wallstreicher. Thanks to all of you who've joined us this evening and have a wonderful evening.